tonight. On behalf of the University of Leipzig and on behalf of the University Alliance Arcus, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you and uh, welcome you to this evening Arcus lecture with the title European Multilingualism Policy Anno Domini 2021. Thank you for attending. Great pleasure for me to announce Professor Waldemar Martiniuk from the Jagiellonski University of Krakow. And I would also like to welcome our international guests who follow this pr presentation via YouTube. There is no doubt that Professor Martiniuk is amongst the most competent scholars in Europe to talk about language policy because he has devoted virtually all his academic life to the learning and teaching of foreign languages. He is the author of numerous scholarly articles, monographs, textbooks, language curricula and examinations. He lectures all over the world, also as a visiting professor in Bochum, Gießen, Göttingen, Mainz, Monastir, Basel, and Stanford. As director of the European Language Center for Modern Languages in Graz, ECML, between 2008 and 2013, he has probably shaped European language policy more than anybody else. The temptation to steal more time from Professor Martiniuk's time and talk about his many academic achievements and merits is tempting, but I will stop here. Great. Before I hand over to Professor Martiniuk, I would like to thank all colleagues who have made today's lecture possible, particularly Ruth Möhring, to Lisa Renon, Kirsten Bergle, to uh, Herr Schmidt, and to Nicolas Rosa. And I would also like to thank the GAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for their financial support. Now, with great pleasure, dear Waldemar, and curiosity that we look forward to your presentation. Please extend a warm welcome to Professor Martinez. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Berenfinger, for this nice introduction. Thank you, Olaf, for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to come over in these difficult times and offer a lecture not just online but also to a live audience. This is so always um, a change. To talk about European multilingualism policy in 45 minutes, it's probably a mission impossible. At least challenging. But I take this challenge and I will try to offer some summary of the developments as I see them. So don't expect um, all aspects related to multilingualism policy in Europe. It's just my own lenses that I'm using for the purpose. I will uh, focus my attention on two intergovernmental organizations that shape the European language policy, means language policy on the intergovernmental level, on the European level the Council of Europe and the European Union. There's a third one, the OECD, also contributing to the developments around policies through their PISA programs and tests. But we leave uh, the OECD uh, tonight uh, for a further consideration. For the Council of Europe, this biggest intergovernmental organization in Europe, currently 47 member states, uh, its 
there are three areas of interest. Democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. In each of the three, languages play a role. So, as the uh, initial sentence on the portal devoted to languages at the Council of Europe says, languages are a fundamental aspect of both people's lives for individual people as for the democratic functioning of societies. It's visible already in the first very important treaty, the European Cultural Convention from 1954, that language is being considered a cultural artifact, a cultural item to be promoted, both in terms of promoting the study of one's own language, as well as allowing to study for, of the languages of the other parties. So a mutual sort of uh, offer and uh, engagement to uh, study languages. The European Cultural Convention is uh, in this article too about studying languages, promoting the study of languages. But I will, as we will see, it, it, the development went far uh, farther than that. The Euro Council of Europe is an organization that is offering the treaties, uh, charters, conventions, and they are considered an international law. If countries decide to sign up for a given charter or convention and ratify th this decision by their parliaments, then it becomes a, a, a law in a given state. Two of them are worth mentioning in addition to the European Cultural Convention. Directly uh, um, devoted to languages, the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages from 1992, as well as the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities from 1998, where regional or minority languages are celebrated and promoted as part of Europe's cultural heritage, and thus their protection and promotion is to be seen as a contribution to the building of a Europe that is based on democracy and cultural diversity. But these three treaties are just the fundament for further actions, further recommendations that do not have the power of law but are to be considered useful instruments to indicate what the uh, countries, members of the Council of Europe, have agreed on. Because all these recommendations have been consulted with all the member states, and all the member states agreed that it's worth pursuing certain actions, ac actions th that are um, uh, listed in those recommendations. Like the first one on my list, this is just a selection that, that, that I consider quite significant when it takes uh, to, uh, uh, to languages. The first one from 98, but then the second one from 2008, uh, where the migration, uh, issue, when migration issues as uh, also uh, an aspect of uh, integration uh, has been taken up and where languages also play a role. Then recommendation from 2008, another one, to member states on the use of the Council of Europe's Common European Framework of Reference for Languages that I'm going to talk in more detail later on, as well as the promotion of plurilingualism as an issue, as a, as a, as a term that the Council of Europe has, has uh, uh, promoted. Recommendation from 2012 to member states on ensuring quality education indicates the importance of languages for quality education, on both on the uh, side of the learner as well as on the side of the 
uh, of the teachers. And uh, the last one on my list here, recommendation on the importance of competences in the languages of schooling, languages of instruction, languages of education, for equity and quality in education and for educational success. You may see a development from the notion of uh, study of languages and possibly an understood as uh, offering uh, courses and classes in foreign languages, as they are called, to more integrated, more comprehensive picture of the role of languages as a crucial aspect of the educational success. There are also uh, recommendations that the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe is issuing, and they indicate also areas of interest for multilingualism policies as promoted by the Council of Europe. Indicating that um, the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, that's the Europe, bigger European Parliament, that's the parliamentary body of the Council of Europe. They have also issued a number of recommendations and the titles of those are also quite uh, indicative for the interest that the member states of the Council of Europe have uh, around languages. In 2001, the European Year of Languages, uh, the uh, commonly celebrated by the Council of Europe and the European Union, which, is, which was not always the case, that these two intergovernment organizations would join together and do something uh, jointly. But they did. And they also uh, decided that we should celebrate the European Day of Languages every year on the 26th of September, which uh, we, uh, at least at my university, we always do. But you can see on the titles, from the titles of the other recommendations that the interest was not just on languages understood as foreign languages at schools, but rather in a broader sense, including sign languages, for example, including the so-called mother tongue in school education. To the term mother tongue, I, I'll return later. As well as one of the latest ones, the issue of tests in language, uh, uh, of language proficiency as part of uh, integration measures. In other words, language tests as migration policy which is also something uh, worth uh, looking at and highly questionable as uh, uh, appropriate. There's a number of resources and references that you may wish to consult, uh, uh, starting from a very comprehensive set of documents, resources, recommendations, materials, even very of very practical value on the platform of resources and references for plurilingual inter and intercultural education. The concept of plurilingual and intercultural education is something that the Council of Europe can be credited for as uh, the, uh, probably the driving force, the core of the multilingualism policy as promoted and shaped by the Council of Europe. Plurilingual education means, in simple terms, to use all languages in the repertoire of learners for the purpose of education. All of them, not just the so-called mother tongue that is not always identical with the language of instruction, even more so in, in nowadays because of the mobility and migration processes, and not only uh, the so-called foreign languages, one or two or three but all languages that pupils bring into the classroom can, may, should be uh, considered a potential of being of potential value for their education. Not neglected, not refused to take, in care, of, to, to take care of, but included and in this way sort of uh, uh, paid uh, tribute to the heritage that the pupils bring with them. The Common European Framework of Reference for Languages uh, is probably the most frequently quoted document of the Council of Europe. 
and I'm going to, uh, uh, in this context, and I'm going to mention a few aspects of this document, what is it really all about? But you can see also that part of what the Council of Europe is devoting in terms of the expert work uh, that they uh, 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 coordinate is uh, related to linguistic integration of adult migrants but and also to projects such as the European language portfolio that is sort of a practical way of implementing the approach offered by the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. The European Centre for Modern Languages of the Council of Europe in Graz is an institution that is uh, conducting, is coordinating uh, international projects on implementation of language policies as promoted and shaped by the Council of Europe. But also intercultural aspects or, or multicultural aspects are being taken care of and, and observed by the experts of the Council of Europe. The, the, the latest interesting uh, framework is a reference framework of competences for democratic culture, where languages and cultures play a role and in this way underline the uh, way uh, competences for democratic culture are being uh, defined. Now if we turn to the European Union, when we open the multilingualism policy portal, you will see the motto, United in Diversity, which already indicates that the European Union is aware of and ready to promote and, and support diversity that is present in the uh, member states. 24 official languages. Some people say uh, that there is some contradiction between the fact that the Council of Europe is using only two official languages, English and French, and uh, 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 European Union is uh, servicing 24 official languages, which means that if you uh, want the European Parliament to function in the 24 languages of the member states, you, you may need 552 language combinations in order to service, to, to, to uh, cater for all needs. Some people ask, is it not uh, a bit too much? The budget is huge, the costs are huge. But the response or the uh, metaphor is this. This is roughly a, a, a price of one espresso per citizen in Europe a year. So if you're ready to sacrifice your espresso, one espresso per year, for the sake that you have service in all four, 24 languages, then you should not question the budgetary uh, issues. The European Union, as well as indicated, is, in, is underlining two things, linguistic diversity and language learning. Language learning understood as something that I improves the competitiveness of the EU economy. And for quite some time, the, the multilingualism policies of the European Union were rather oriented on the economic aspect of the economic value of languages. And, but now I see that the, the, these two big intergovernmental organizations get closer and closer to each other, which I'm happy to see, because it's not like the Council of Europe having principles and the European Union having economy. I didn't say money. So uh, that uh, it, 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 it's probably due to the fact that it's understood all throughout all these years, say from 2001, it became clearer and clearer, not just for the experts working for the Council of Europe, that it's about people. It's about personal development and happiness of, of, of people in Europe where that languages are important. It's not just for uh, employment and not just for career. Yes, it's important for getting jobs but it's also important for social cohesion, for just uh, uh, guaranteeing, ensuring that people are developing themselves, feeling well in their communities and societies, and that kids get properly educated 
uh, uh, unrelated to where they come from and which languages they bring with them. Uh, three goals may be uh, underlined on the side of the European Union. The first one is to encourage language learning and promote linguistic diversity. The second one, as already mentioned, to give citizens access to legislation, procedures, and information in their own languages. And I can tell you it's a very good feeling when you come to Brussels and when you take part. I was uh, a few times invited to uh, participate in some discussions of some committees of the European Parliament. And here you come and, and, and speak Polish because you, you don't have to use English or any other language. You can simply stand up and speak Polish and it gets translated into all the other languages present in the room. It's a good feeling. I, uh, and then it, the response would come if from, from uh, Polish representatives in Polish. If uh, someone comes from Germany, speaks German. And so it works. This is multilingualism life. And it works. Uh, it, it's really a very uh, sp special feeling. Because normally, you don't experience it that way. Because wherever you go, you always compromise and use this or that language. And there, it's just, it's, it's just that you all, all, only are surprised. So I wonder what language now will be used for the purpose. And if I realize, oh, oh, Finnish is not in my repertoire, then I grab to the headphones and I have the translation and then I can pick which translation into which language do I want. The same goes for, for the, um, if, you, if you were interested in following some of the debates in the European Parliament, it's the same. You have a, 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 a panel and you pick your language independently of who is speaking in and what language they are using. You can use your own, or you can switch between languages because sometimes you get annoyed by this or that interpreter. But this, is, this may happen. There is, there's an array of official documents uh, of the European Union. However, languages uh, sort of, how should I put it in a diplomatic way? Uh, to deal with languages can be dangerous politically. Policies uh, around languages uh, can be about the status of languages, the corpus of languages, or education. Corpus is okay. You can debate whether this is uh, the proper structure, whether this is the proper orthography, or whether you need a reform. This is fine. Education can become political, but status is political. And when you deal with status of languages, it's not an easy task. And this is maybe why we don't have a commissioner for multilingualism that we had in 2004 when the European Union grew by 10 new member states. It was a euphoria in terms of how diverse we are and how many languages we are now having in the European Union. So we had two, I think, I think two terms of commissioners for multilingualism, but it turned out to be a hot potato because mostly the commissioners were sort of uh, busy with uh, solving conflicts between languages. And believe me, to solve a conflict between languages, it's, it's even more impossible than to talk about policies in 45 minutes. Uh, so the principle that uh, uh, is uh, probably behind all these actions and documents is the subsidiarity principle, meaning that basically education, including language education, it's not a business of the European Union. It's a business of each and every member state. However, when it comes to economy, when it comes to education related to economy, you discover that, uh-uh, subsidiarity, fine, but it's important to take care of uh, education in languages 
and uh, you cannot leave it outside of the scope of interest uh, even for uh, the uh, uh, main uh, uh, in, uh, 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 organizational instances. Uh, interesting documents. The first one, uh, the, the famous uh, Barcelona principle uh, that was uh, announced in 2002 before the EU grew bigger. It was already, it was still about foreign languages, mostly. It was still about encouraging people, young people, but uh, 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 even, uh, 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 or indeed, li in a lifelong learning modus, all people to learn foreign languages. And it, it seemed to be a very clear and, and simple uh, uh, declaration. Europeans in the uh, member states of the uh, European Union should learn mo their mother tongue plus two foreign languages. Simple. However, when you, when you start thinking, but whose mother tongue? Which mother tongue? Each mother tongue that the pupils are bringing with them? Oh, oh, oh no, 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 they said. We, what we mean is the, the mother tongue of the state meaning the language of instruction. So this mother tongue plus two, very catchy formula, was abandoned because it, 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 it turned out to be uh, ambiguous or, or even uh, dangerous. So now, <laughs> when I, whenever I see reflections of that principle, that Barcelona principle, it says one plus two. So define your mother tongue how you want, one plus two is what we mean. And then it explains, as I will show in, in the latest document, uh, that the first one, the previously called mother tongue, is the language of instruction. That's the previously uh, labeled mother tongue. Uh, step by step, I uh, f see in the documents of the European Union moving from the foreign languages and economic aspect towards people and social needs, uh, individual needs and social needs. An interesting document was uh, published in 2008. As you see, 2008 was quite rich in terms of uh, communications, resolutions, uh, uh, and also studies. A rewarding challenge is in, uh, the, the title of that document. A group of, of um, experts in, uh, 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 has been uh, assigned a task to, uh, to provide answer to the question that uh, 2008 was uh, already uh, uh, um, very important. How can we handle this diversity? We like it so much, but how can we handle it so that it, it, it's of benefit and not of uh, not just creating problems. Because you can view diversity everywhere from these two perspectives. You can view it as something very interesting because this is what makes it interesting. It's not all the same. It's diverse. But on the other hand, it, it can be difficult to handle because diversity is probably more difficult to handle than mono city if there is a word like that. If, uh, if there's just one language uh, in your educational system, seemingly it's easier to handle than if you, as may be the case in many European schools these days, when you enter a, a class of pupils and say, I experienced that in Graz. Graz is a very good example for that. 32 pupils in, in a class, only one is uh, the, of the standard lang language background, meaning brings German of the school type into the classroom from home. All the others, 31 pupils, bring all sorts of languages, all mixture of languages you may imagine, and this is the reality. This is not exception. This is what happens in, in many schools. How to handle that? You may have, again, two um, uh, contradictory options. One is forget about diversity. We just use one language for all 
and insist that one language is being promoted and developed. That won't work in the long run because it's creating problems for the people in question, for the young learners. And sooner or later, they will start rebelling or they will have problems. And if they have problems, then you will have problems as a state regulator. Because if you don't educate your kids properly, your society w is going to have a problem sooner or later. They have proposed certain uh, uh, mm, uh, solutions for that. If you uh, are interested, you can read it in their document. Uh, the latest documents uh, 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 indicate that the uh, gremia of the uh, European Union and the, uh, um, uh, the departments of the Council of Europe are getting together. And I'm going to illustrate it by uh, offering some um, in-depth analysis of the last, uh, of last two documents, including the Council recommendation on a comprehensive approach to the teaching and learning of languages from 2019. And I'm aware of the time, so we skip uh, some parts that I have uh, too much detail about. And just to indicate, and this is maybe uh, useful for you to take up if you're interested because all these uh, um, studies and, and sources have uh, hyperlinked. So if I, leave you, uh, uh, if I leave my PowerPoint with you, you can simply click and get there. Because what is very good and what is, what is probably the very uh, uh, added uh, value of the work of the European Union is that they are funding lots of studies and instruments that uh, deliver evidence for all sorts of um, uh, uh, um, issues. Uh, one, of, one source is the Eurydice network, where they are publishing key data on teaching languages at schools in Europe or in the member states. They are also publishing Eurobarometer, meaning they're ask, asking people about their opinion. You can easily confront opinions of people and the uh, facts from stemming from schools if they correspond. Uh, the survey on language skills was an interesting uh, project run in 2011-12. It was a, a language test in a number of languages that was supposed to tell us, so where do we stand with the competence level in t uh, for languages? It turned out to be a very difficult task because it's, uh, uh, it, it's costly and it's, oh, it's causing tensions when you, when, you pro when you announce the results. Because if, when you announce the results, then ranking is the way. Ranking is very efficient, but is annoying, because then one country would see them being ranked lower than the, their neighbors, and they are then uh, rebelling because they, do, they don't necessarily agree with the results. So the, the survey lang worked as an interesting experiment how to try to assess the level of language competences across countries, across uh, languages. However, it didn't lead to the European indicator of language competence, which was the aim. The aim was to set certain goal for, say, 2020 at that time. Now, probably it would be 2050. Where uh, are we now and where do we want to be in 2050? That's not easy because of the differences in educational systems. Germany is always a problem because it's not one educational system. <laughs> so you cannot say Germany. You have to have a whole list of, of educational systems that you all label ger ger as German. Uh, Interesting studies that you may uh, wish to consult, like the one on foreign language proficiency and emplo employability, the one on the impact of the Erasmus student exchange program. Also, this one uh, on migrants in European schools, and also in language teaching and learning in multilingual classrooms. That's what now 
the reality is. Actions that the European Union is funding, this is also the, the, to be credited for that. Probably out of the many programs like Leonardo, Grundtvig, uh, I don't remember more, but Erasmus survived as the one that turned out to be most successful in most bringing most tangible results. Part of the game was to encourage young people to learn languages of the countries where they go to. If it works the way it was uh, meant, I'm not that sure. However, it's, uh, um, uh, as a mobility program, is definitely a success. And most probably some language and some multilingualism has been developed as a side effect uh, uh, indicated wished and also uh, happening. The European language label is a competition that each year, year is uh, um, uh, granting awards to uh, uh, innovative initiatives in language learning. Quite an interesting initiative uh, in, uh, across all the member states of the European Union. And not to, to uh, forget the cooperation between the EU and the Council of Europe when it comes to activities and projects coordinated by the European Center for Modern Languages. I should not be uh, uh, too modest in saying that I spent some time to convince the uh, officials in Brussels to go for concrete projects that, uh, they could, that we could uh, jointly offer to, to Europe. It, worked, uh, 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 it, 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 it works now in a, to, to some limited uh, scope, but it works. At least these three topics are now being uh, commonly funded by the uh, Council of Europe and the European Union. These are the latest developments. In the Council of Europe, the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages has been updated, renovated, supplemented, developed further in a very interesting way. And uh, in order to uh, publish it and not confuse the users of the old one, it's called companion volume, whatever, it's, whatever it says. I wonder what the German translation of that would be. You have it already, Olaf? Light, big light bulb. <laughs> yes, a companion volume, accompanying. It's not just companion volume, it's, it's probably much more, but nevertheless. Uh, briefly, uh, I skip the, I won't preach about the Common European Framework too much, but I, I'm going to skip the uh, slides uh, about uh, the document itself, but I'm going to uh, um, come back to this new companion volume uh, that was uh, um, started work on which was started in 2014, and the idea was, on the one hand, to develop further what was left undeveloped in the original document, and, what, uh, uh, and, and for which the uh, Council of Europe was highly criticized, but also to take into account the latest developments, like the technological changes. Uh, uh, in, uh, by providing descriptors, for example, for online interaction. It was very timely done because it, the, the publish, publishing year was 2020 and in 2020 we were locked down and had to go over to online education altogether and could even then uh, uh, see or uh, use the descriptors for online interaction to begin with as something uh, the, tackling this, uh, this area. Uh, what is interesting is the concept of mediation that I just briefly uh, outlined. Mediation was indicated in the, in the uh, original document as a fourth mode of language use and learning. The first one being reception, the second one being production, the third one interaction, the fourth one was mediation. However, mediation was left uh, unexplored at that time as more or less probably translation, which is mediation. 
uh, why was that was probably that Brian North, who was the, the uh, author of the descriptors, could not find any corresponding to mediation, and uh, uh, there were no scales offered for this uh, mode of language use. Now it has been, the, uh, it has been supplemented by a whole bunch of scales of illustrative descriptors indicating what is meant with use of language for the purpose of mediation. And this is quite stunning, at least in my view. It's, not, it's indicating that schools have a mediative function and a language has mostly, in most instances, a mediative function. So now we have uh, uh, the description of uh, language use expanded by another set of uh, 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 scales of illustrative uh, descriptions. And um, we have now, I see a new, uh, I think, a new picture of language uh, uh, use and language learning with mediation described more in detail beyond what was then uh, meant as just maybe uh, uh, a translation, meaning you need someone to translate if two people cannot communicate. Then you need a mediator that brings them together. But expanding this concept of being mediator between people that uh, have no common ground is stunning because if you think about it, it's not just between people, it's between texts, it's between concepts. So what are we doing here? We are doing mediation. I'm mediating my way of understanding of the policies to you, uh, 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 hoping that, that it can create some bridge between the two and that some uh, understanding, some some communication takes place. Mediating texts, mediating concepts, in addition to mediating communication, is, in my view, what education in general is all about. And uh, if you look at the uh, detailed uh, descriptors or scales, uh, relaying specific information, explaining data, processing text, note-taking, expressing a personal response to texts, analysis and criticism of texts. This is what academic education is all about. This is what any act of education is all about. So now we see how important language competences are for education. It's not just communication understood in this old-fashioned way, like uh, buying a bottle of Coke or uh, 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 um, maybe inviting someone over for coffee. It's far more, and it's far more serious business, really, uh, using languages for the purpose of mediating a text, mediating concepts. For example, this set, collaborating in a group. It's almost uh, scary, I would say, for teachers when they see that, oh my goodness, how am I going to teach them to use language to facilitate collaborative interaction with peers? This is happening implicitly. This is happening. That is, has never been described, specified the way we have it now. There are also, uh, in addition to activities, there are also strategies that uh, are important to underline and, and define, and they have been defined uh, in this new version. Linking to previous knowledge, adapting language, breaking down complicated information, amplifying a text or streamlining a text, this is what academic work is much about, and strategic uh, uh, work in our uh, area. So I I all in all, there are issues with this new uh, expanded concept of mediation, but, but I think it's, it's intriguing and I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, fascinated by this possibility to consider mediation as a concept for education at large, 
not just for language education. Now, just to finalize this council recommendation on a comprehensive approach to the teaching and learning of languages, the European Union document, that is probably the latest one. When I read it, it's, I feel like I would read a document by the Council of Europe, uh, seeing how these two big organizations have found a common language, talking about multilingualism, as important as it says in the preamble to this recommendation of the Council, I know you may be confused by the many councils. And this is what my students also complain about. It's the Council of Europe, there's the Council of the European Union, and there is the European Council. So there are three councils to we have to differentiate between. This Council is the Council of the European Union. It's probably the most uh, important organ of the European Union. Uh, it, and this is a recommendation to the member states of the European Union, where it's underlined that multilingual competence is at the heart of the vision of the European education area. It's a very strong statement where multilingual competence is understood uh, in a very broad sense, as we will see from the other uh, um, uh, statements included in this recommendation, like this one that this is a, one of the key competences for employability, personal fulfillment, active citizenship, intercultural understanding, and social inclusion. Uh, then uh, it uh, obviously uh, now has been recognized as a value for on personal level, social level, and economic level, which I consider novelty uh, very much desired. Uh, certainly uh, uh, studies like this one, uh, the vocational training sur survey, that provide evidence, for example, that uh, um, you lose your business if you don't have people uh, capable of handling several languages, or if you don't send your people f to countries where they can get some training in languages, you will also uh, not survive in this global market. But uh, also it's, it's about full integration of immigrant children, students and adults. That's what you see now in the recommendation of the European Union. Uh, regional and minority languages are being appreciated and, and uh, promoted now by the European Union as well as by the Council of Europe. Languages added by the immigrant or refugee populations. It's a very uh, strong statement. They complete the linguistic, linguistic picture in Europe. It's not just about foreign languages. It's not about just about language of instruction in the member states, but also all these languages that are now coming to Europe and worth uh, being treated on a par with uh, all other languages. Schools uh, are uh, becoming aware of the necessity to make sure that all children, regardless of background on, and first language, acquire a very good level of the language of schooling. You see now the term that was coined by the Council of Europe in the documents of the European Union that you need to educate your young people, taking into account their pot uh, lang language potential that they bring uh, with them. Uh, and uh, uh, raise language awareness in schools, uh, um, uh, exploiting all skills of all pupils in all languages that they can offer. Uh, in the end, uh, in summary, uh, it's, it's clear that the uh, multilingualism is now not just a, a matter of uh, um, offering uh, instruction in mother tongue class two, but it's much more, and the development is uh, that, uh, something that I can only welcome. The recommendations that are being issued based upon those uh, prerequisites uh, start with um, this old uh, 
the, this old proposition to learn at least one other European language in one third language, but also strengthening competence in the languages of schooling, supporting teachers in addressing the use of specific language in their respective subject areas. This is also coming from the Council of Europe, indicating that all education goes through language, meaning that physics is also part to a great part language instruction. Mathematics is a language instruction based uh, uh, subject. History, geography, whatever is being taught goes through language. And if you don't develop language competences uh, with you in your pu pupils, then uh, subject uh, 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 um, instruction is also suffering. There's nothing like non-language subjects. Sometimes this is being used, non-language subjects, meaning not languages, but for example, history. History is a language subject, a lot, in fact. So uh, this is what is being recommended to support the development of new language awareness, to assess and validate all language competences, not just those that are part of the curriculum, to refer to the Common European Framework of the Council of Europe, and to invest uh, in, um, in the initial and continuing education of teachers to maintain a broad language offer. This is not easy, but this is a part of the game. And include a preparation for them to be ready for linguistic diversity in the classroom, as I indicated before. And for the researchers, as for example, uh, to encourage use of innovative, inclusive, and multilingual pedagogies, including now digital tools, but also uh, approaches such as intercomprehension, and CLIL, that is much, uh, on, uh, uh, much uh, being talked about. The Council at the end, the, Euro the Council of the European Union, welcomes the cooperation with the uh, Council of Europe, use of the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, and cooperation with the European Centre for Modern Languages of the Council of Europe, which makes me happy. And in this state of happiness, I thank you very much. Dziękuję Państwu za uwagę. Yeah, Valdemar, thank you very much for uh, this captivating talk. I hope it was captured and uh, we will provide the link to our online guests. We have time for questions. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah, thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, and I have a very practical question. Um, there are so many councils and many recommendations and um, you opened a truly new universe of policy documents for us. Most of us, of course, know the framework and the companion volume and we know that it is not always used in the idea of their inventors, but help us a little bit when we um, want to believe our state ministers in Dresden or in Berlin that language matters, what is the document that has really sharp teeth that we can use for our arguments that we um, need to improve multilingual education in German schools and universities? Thanks. This is, this is a good question. This is a question I have been r getting everywhere I go. <laughs> so what is your question, right? So what? There are these many recommendations, documents, they all sound fine. They're all great. Hmm. Well, if your country has signed up and ratified one of the conventions, like the Charter, the Framework Convention, and the European Cultural Convention, then it's a law in your country. And if you discover that something is not 
uh, being handled accordingly, then you have right as a citizen of this country to complain that this, the uh, law, the international law that this country has accepted as his, its own is not being followed. Uh, the recommendations, that's the uh, less binding document recommendations and resolutions. Resolutions are more or less of a declarative status. Here, here with, uh, we declare this or that. But uh, I would also claim that resolutions and recommendations are also worth you being used for whatever purpose seems to be in a given context because each recommendation each resolution has been uh, processed and adopted and accepted by the representatives of all member states. So it's not just a piece of paper. It's a recommendation where there is a signature of, a, of your ambassador or wh whoever was the one signing up. This is, this is what I sometimes have a problem with in, in, in the debates about both the Council of Europe and the European Union. It looks like they in Brussels did this or that, or they in Strasbourg have done this or that. They have not done anything without you, your participation through your representatives. So whatever is the recommendation, is in a given recommendation, should be then pursued because your country has agreed to this recommendation that this is something that we have agreed to pursue. It's not binding. However, it has a, 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 it, it's significant and it's meaningful. And I would simply take, print them out, take with me, go to the given minister or whoever that is and show, this is what you agreed to. And it says in uh, paragraph this or that, that this, Germany should do this or that. I know Germany is a problematic state because of the fact that you have uh, multiple states in the state. Uh, and this is, this is another, because then your minister would say, but this is what they in Berlin did and not in Leipzig. But this, is, this, I, cannot, <laughs> this I cannot be. <laughs> called <laughs> to solve as a problem. But all these documents, or uh, official documents where your representative contributed, participated, and agreed to. So it's not an external document. It's an internal European commonly agreed upon document, each and every one. The common European framework of reference of languages has no status whatsoever. It's just a publication. It's just a, it's not a piece of paper, <laughs> but it's just a publication. And if you have read this document, then you know that this, the following every chapter, there is this famous sentence by John Trim. The users of the framework may wish to consider, this is the British English uh, uh, discourse, the users of the framework may wish to consider and where appropriate, state whether. And then the points are being made. That's the way. However, uh, in uh, many places, it's considered a standard to follow. And uh, I know that I, I, I have a collection of texts where it says, this is uh, the uh, this is what is required by the Council of Europe. No way. You may wish to consider. And where appropriate, do this if you think it's useful in your case. But don't tell us the uh, Council of Europe has prescribed this or that and you have to follow. It's, it's magic, but th this is how it works. So, Probably uh, the framework is much more known than all these recommendations, I agree, because of the scales 
and because of the testing business, but you know, this is how promotion works. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Maybe I have a question. I would like to play the devil's advocate. Good. <laughs> um, you know, um, there is this narrative of multilingualism, and I'm just wondering, do we really need it? Um, you know, we have fantastic um, IT, uh, which provides uh, almost perfect translation. We have DeepL, we have Google Translate. Uh, these programs have already altered uh, the characteristics of whole professions. Uh, translators do different things than they did before. Um, we also have fantastic um, um, programs for interpretation. I have a friend who does not know any foreign language and if he wants to chat with um, a Russian friend, he s simply takes his smartphone and uh, uses it and uh, in a certain way they ca they're able to communicate. Do we really need it? Do we need it? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say uh, I share this uh, experience when I when I go <laughs> to China I don't speak Mandarin, but I have never problem communicating through a, an application that every taxi driver in Beijing would have. So whatever you tell them, the only information he needs is what language are you using? And then he or she can handle it using their smartphones. Uh, but this is, this is one aspect of multilingualism. And certainly, we should take it into account. And yes, I think it's, it's a huge change in all aspects of uh, both the way we make use of multilingualism as well as how we teach languages. I agree with that, that we are probably much behind technological developments and uh, uh, much uh, is uh, indicating in a direction that <laughs> is scary for, for student teachers because may, they may think they are becoming obsolete one day and you will just buy your languages in online and uh, implement it somewhere here or somewhere there and uh, if you get a good promotion, you get three languages for the price of one, and uh, that's it. And uh, this is not just a joke, because uh, the, the advancement of the artificial intelligence is really, uh, uh, may really one day provide this, uh, uh, not that you need to be, uh, undergo any surgery, but that you can speak whatever language you, you wish, and it's automatically transformed into the other language, even using your own voice, tone, intonation, all the characteristics that the artificial intelligence can learn in, in a second. Uh, I've seen experiments like that. I think, it was, was it not Steve Jobs, one of them, speaking English and uh, but you hear Mandarin. You hear him speaking Mandarin with a slight delay, not 20 seconds, less. Uh, uh, but, and it was, it was scary because he, he would open his mouth and you hear him speaking Mandarin. His voice, all his prosodic features that he is known for. Uh, uh, but still with a delay and not very accurate. But they are working on the case. So much to be uh, prepared for because of the developments like that. But I still consider this as uh, in terms of diversity and in terms of uh, uh, cultural developments and resources that you can, uh, uh, human resources that you can activate. I think there's still a chance for us to still not lose our jobs and, and have uh, interested learners. Maybe I in some uh, years from now, the teacher would speak German and the pupils would just pick which language they want him or her 
uh, to here. And the reverse may be the case. But it does not eliminate the beauty of linguistic diversity and the cultural aspects of it. But mm -hmm. technically, yes, there's much to come. Okay, thank you. Any other remarks, questions, objections? Yeah, I even see a chance for multilingualism in technology so that we don't have to speak English only <laughs> <laughs> because the technology would allow a variety of languages to be used. That would be lovely. <laughs>